from time to time, I buy lottery tickets. Not the scratch, the sniff kind, nor the daily draw, nor the poker-themed ones, or anything quite so like that. I'm only interested in those big weekly draws, the big money jackpots, 25 million, 30 million, 50 million. I don't buy them every week e either. Only on those weeks when the jackpots have grown uh, fat on the harvested souls of disappointed losers. When the pot has grown to more than 20 million, say, I'll buy a single ticket. I'll carefully fold it up and put it in my wallet between the Canadian tire money, I'm saving up for a power tool, and the plastic real money money. Some say the lottery is a tax on people who are bad at math. Not true, at least not in my case. I'd say rather it's a tax on people who suffer from a certain kind of aspirational thinking. I'm buying the opportunity to fantasize about what I would do with that kind of big money. Sure, there'd be a boat, not a gaudy mega yacht or something. It'd be something classy like a sailboat, maybe a Tartan 5300, the kind of boat you can take down to the Caribbean or around Cape Horn. But you know, that money would be great news for God, too. I promise. I'd certainly pay off the deficit of the church and undertake a massive building program and make some foundations on a whole host of issues that would do great good in the city of Toronto and beyond. Those sorts of fantasies involving the church are no less vivid for me than the sailboat ones. For example, I have a fantasy about turning the park across the street into a peace park in memory of Sergeant Ryan Russell, who was killed there, and then particularly uh, focusing on the issue of the intersection of mental illness and policing. I'd pay for the whole thing, of course, and the only thing I would ask is there'd be a koi pond, because I love koi ponds. I could just imagine sitting in my peace park, stroking a white cat, and contemplating the awesome, you know, helping people and stuff. When the weekend comes, and I learn that I did not, in fact, win the lottery and will not be building any peace ponds for, uh, for koi anytime soon, I comfort myself with the other great panacea, technology. I turn on the Apple TV that's hooked up to my TV, and I rewatch the latest Apple keynote address. I fast forward to the best part, Tim Cook saying, just one more thing, the watch, the Apple watch. It wants the precious. It needs the precious. Seeing an orbit above the Earth, it will soon dominate. The watch promises a better life. It already has health and fitness features to gently remind you to stand more and to walk more. I know, revolutionary. With its patented taptic technology, it'll tap you on the wrist to remind you of your appointments or that that most important tweet has come in that'll shatter your world with a mention of you. It'll make me a more compassionate person, a better person, a more punctual person, I'm sure of it. Certainly a more connected leader. You know, I'll be able to control my Apple TV from my wrist. <laughs> Am I really that lustful, that idolatrous? Maybe not, but I'm not far from it. I spent months working and planning a series of initiatives that promised fresh expressions of church and to give rise to new communities overlapping with our own here. Sure, mission, mission, mission. A farmer's market, a coffee shop, a significant renovation of the space. My team and I spent, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks working on these plans. We started interviewing pioneer ministers and architects and potential business partners in food service. Surely the diocese would support this, I thought. Sure, they'll let us use our own capital to fund this. I was making plans, of course, for money that I didn't quite have yet. Then, a couple of months ago, I had lunch with a Jedi priest from England, well known for spiritual communities that he's founded over there. He's a sort of high midichlorian priest who uh, strong in the force. The kind of guy with that contemplative voice, you know, that you hear on, uh, on podcasts sometimes, you know, that just kind of brings you right into that prayer place just with the sound and timbre of his voice. As a Jedi and a, I ate lunch at my favorite Toronto pub, a small batch IPA, ribs, sweet potato fries. He listened to my dreams. He congratulated me on my initiative and thought my planning process was great, but then he gave me the reality check that I needed. First off, he pointed out that the current climate, in the current climate, I was unlikely to get the kind of financial support that I was looking for until I'd actually demonstrated some success on the ground. Market studies and surveys and traffic counts were not enough. I would have to actually do some projects before I could get any help. He showed me the business plan for his own cafe that he founded in London. It contained a, a phase zero, a place to start with no capitalization at all. He talked about driving around London, picking up discarded furniture from the curb smacked my forehead. Of course I needed a phase zero. Second, he asked me about my plans. How long was I planning to stay? As we continued, it became clear that starting projects of this sort requires some serious sacrifice on part of the pioneer. It's not enough to work late nights and ruin a few work shirts with espresso stains. 
you got to let go of your future plans. This is going to take a lot longer than you ever thought possible, he told me. You have to be willing to stay as long as it takes. There can be no time limit on how long you will be there. So much for itinerancy. I know, said the Jedi. It's not what you wanted to hear. Third, he grilled me about my spiritual life. How was I praying? When was I praying? You ignore this at your peril, he assured me, before giving me some helpful suggestions. You see where this is going, of course. The diocese put conditions on access to our funds that we won't be able to satisfy for some months to come in the best case scenario. Nor do we get the big grants that we had applied for. We did get a bit of good news. We got one small grant, a REACH grant, and with that few thousand dollars, we were able to found our farmer's market, and it's going. Of course, it's harder than I thought it would be to get going, but it's going, and that's not nothing. Manna. It's never what you wanted, but it's enough for today. God's economy is not our economy. We can grumble about the unfairness of it all we want. It won't change the fact that we get what we get. Louis C.K. had a famous moment on Conan O'Brien's late night show when he said, everything's amazing and nobody's happy. He was talking about how incredibly convenient our lives have become. And yet everyone continues to complain. How quickly the world owes him something he knew existed only 10 seconds ago, he said. You're sitting in a chair in the sky. He's talking about a story of this, this man who was on this airplane flight next to him. And uh, they came over the announcements and they said, you know, Wi-Fi is now available for your, uh, for your enjoyment on the airplane. So everybody flipped open their laptops and their iPhones and they started watching Netflix videos. And then the system crashed and they came on and they said, yeah, oh, sorry, the internet is out. It's going to be out for the rest of the flight. And the guy next to Louis C.K. On the, on the flight goes, oh, my God. And, and he was so upset. And Louis C.K. is thinking, you know, you're in a chair in the sky flying and you're able to watch Netflix videos. <laughs> you didn't even know you could do that until 10 seconds ago. And so this is what we Christians do. We preach something about this gap between our, our aspirations and our reality, the golem gap. Golem, the character from the Lord of the Rings who obsesses over the precious ma magical ring, like all of us seduced by our dreams of what we want. It doesn't matter that we desire a sailboat, a watch, a peace park, an end to cancer. The truth is that our covetousness distorts our own view of reality, our own ability to apprehend what is right in front of us. This Sunday's gospel lesson, the laborers want more than they have been promised. They thought the landowner owed them something more than the latecomers to the work. Quote, the landowner's question, are you envious because I am generous, in verse 15, is the translation of a Greek idiom, which literally translated as, is your eye evil because I am good? An evil eye suggests a deeper problem than meets the eye. As Jesus taught earlier, quote, the eye is the lamp of the body. So your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, if you have the evil eye, your whole body will be full of darkness. In this account, the evil eye was the opposite of generosity, jealousy, and greed, and stinginess. That's from Emerson Powery. That's the golem gap, the dis-ease that infects our way of seeing the world, an evil eye that fails to see what is possible if we don't get the grant, or the lottery win, or the magical watch. Notice in this passage that it was directed to the disciples. It's sandwiched between the story of the rich young man who cannot follow Jesus because he cannot let go of his manna, and the request of James and John's mom that they have a special place in the kingdom. They too have borne the heat of the day since they've been with Jesus from the beginning of his mission. But the mystery of who will be given such an honor is beyond even Jesus to know. It is not mine to grant. Here comes the evil eye again. You know, the disciples are not pleased. But Jesus teaches them that greatness in the kingdom comes through service. These are teachings for us about how we ought to react, whether we have been blessed with resources like the rich young man or long for such things like James and John's mother. How telling that this chapter that we read today ends with the healing of blind men, two of them. They seek something, too. They long for the restoration of their sight. But they don't actually start with that. They start with a prophetic act of Jesus seeing. Quote, have mercy on us, Lord, son of David, it says in verse 31. Such a simple prayer. Moved with compassion, Jesus touches their eyes. Immediately they regained their sight and followed him. I pray that God will fix my sight, too. That that golem gap might be removed so that I can see more clearly and follow more nearly. I pray that you will be touched by such healing of your sight, too. Amen. So now as we commonly do, I'll 
open this up for any comments anybody might have. A lot in that sermon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. What was it particularly that, that touched you, if I may ask? Just that uh, how unsatisfied I am with simple things, like yeah. the way my hair grows. And it's like, meanwhile, everything I need is right there. Yeah. You know? I, was, I was walking to church today, this morning. And, um, you know, it was raining and it was kind of nasty. And I was listening to a podcast that I listen to from time to time called Pray As You Go, which is a series of meditations that are designed so that you can listen to them and be prayerful while you're doing ordinary things like the dishes or walking to work. And um, there was a line there about, you know, do you see God's blessing at, you know, every moment, something like that. And I really didn't feel like I was feeling God's blessing because, you know, my ball cap had soaked through. So, you know, my luscious hair was just soaked with water, you know, and, and that's, that's how it was, you know, and I was trying to think, gosh, I'm just not at that place at this moment, and I tried to kind of look around and see if I could see something beautiful, and, and I kind of maybe felt a little bit, but it, it's tough, it's tough, yeah. Others. Yeah, Brian. Like what you said. I like what you said about how uh, about how objectives, um, the ones that you expressed, and the ones that we may all hold from time to time, uh, can distort reality and cause us uh, not to observe things that we ought to be looking at, um, to exaggerate the importance of other things. Um, it's a very cogent point. Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, I, I suppose that one can shape their desires to some degree in the objectives. But I think one of the points that I'd like to make is that I'm not really sure that it matters at the end of the day. That, you know, even if you um, believe that your desires, you've cultivated the sense that they're in alignment with the things that God wants, they're still your desires. Like, there's still some ego in it. And it's very difficult to just accept, you know, what, what you have and to be in that place. Yeah, I agree. Jen. So I do this around vacations. I plan a vacation, and I think I like planning it more than I actually like doing it. And I get to the vacation, and I feel a little ripped off because all of these magical ideas inside my head didn't necessarily come out the way I thought they would. Fortunately, I married someone who would rather just stay home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> You can speak and defend yourself. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think we, like, I, I, I find myself getting discontented with my everyday life. And then I think, well, if I go on a sabbatical to the south of France, then that's going to fix everything. And it doesn't always work out that way. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing to see this play out in the lives of children. Uh, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen this with yours. But with Henry, you know, uh, we, I took him this summer to the aquarium and uh, downtown, and he had to have this plastic speedboat that you put batteries in and it goes around the tub. And it was like, you know, 10 bucks or whatever. And so I said, are you really sure? You know, I did the whole thing to make sure this is really what he wanted. And because I told him he could have one toy, right, from the gift shop. So he decided that's really what he wanted. And he, he took it home and he played with it obsessively for about three or four days, right? And then pretty soon it was just, it was old news, <laughs> right? And I thought, wow, you know, you were so desperate to have that, you know, at the time that you got it. You know, like the, the desire was so intense, you know, and, and, how do we, is that just part of human nature? How do we kind of try to program ourselves around that? I, I have no idea, right? I mean, I think that that's what, that's what we do in the gospel, right? We try to, try to change the way that we apprehend what we have. Yeah. Maybe one more comment. Yeah, Ben. Um, well, I'm just reminded that as we pray the Lord's Prayer, we, we pray for our daily bread. And I, I just, I think there's such an irony in, in 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 the um, in the reading in the, the first reading because of the bread that comes the Israelites say what is it and sometimes I think that sense of what is it we pray we're praying for um, God knows what we need and so you know we may not always recognize it as the answer to our prayers but in fact it is. 
Yeah, in, in, the, in the story from Exodus, uh, not only did they not sort of know what it is or recognize it at first, but they also, they had this really vivid fantasy of what life was like uh, it, with the Israelites, the, the flesh pots. You know, there's actually, there's a band of pastors in the Midwest called the Flesh Pots of Egypt, which is a great name for a band, for a Christian rock band. Anyway, anyway uh, you know, they had this idea, but, you know, at the time it was horrible enslavement, right? So it shows you how that disease of the eye, the evil eye, it sort of, it, 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 it distorts the reality, right? And it makes it hard for them to see what's right in front of them, and yet to see the past in this way that's totally, you know, corrupted.